Hello, Cybersecurity Skills class, and welcome to Lecture 2. And in this lecture, we are going to talk about process in criminal investigations, uh, and in particular relating to electronic evidence. So the first uh, piece of this discussion is to talk about the background law relating to search and seizure. And that background law is going to, um, of course, form the background for all of our discussion about the criminal investigation of electronic evidence. And the bedrock of that background is the Fourth Amendment. So the Fourth Amendment, as uh, you all probably know, is the provision of the Constitution that deals with search and seizure. And as the amendment says, the right of the people to be secure in their person, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. So there is a uh, statement here about reasonableness that any search or seizure has to be reasonable and there's a provision here about search warrants and the kind of cause that has to support a search warrant and of course the historical background of this amendment has to do with um, the one of the key touchstones of the American Revolution which was the uh, provision for general assistance writs and warrants under which the uh, British Crown uh, could go ahead and you know search a home or occupy a home or um, commandeer property or goods or persons uh, really without uh, any sort of due process. So this is a fundamental bedrock principle of our constitutional system and however we're going to think about its relationship to electronic kinds of evidence, we have to try and think about ways as lawyers in which um, the legitimate need to obtain electronic evidence in relation to uh, crimes or possible crimes is um, always seen in light of and balanced against this basic principle. So we're going to talk first about search warrants and then we're going to talk about um, kind of related or subsidiary kinds of authority that often come into play in cases involving electronic evidence and in particular we'll talk a little bit about wiretaps, we'll talk about uh, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act and the Stored Communications Act, we'll talk about pen registers and trap and trace devices, and we'll briefly talk about national security letters. So first let's take a moment and we'll look at Federal Rule of Criminal Procedure 41 which is the rule that governs the issuance of search warrants. And as we move through the definitional section in Part A, there's a few things I want you to notice in Subpart B. So first, that the um, party that requests the warrant is a federal law enforcement officer or an attorney for the government. Of course, this is a federal rule, and states will have um, some sort of similar rule within the within the state and within for state uh, criminal proceedings. So it's a law enforcement officer or attorney for the government. It's an ex parte proceeding. Um, you know, very often it's simply done on papers, on affidavits uh, that have to support that there is probable cause for the warrant and have to define as the uh, rules require with some reasonable specificity what is requested. If the, uh, the, court, the court may grant the warrant may, uh, and issue the warrant, may deny the warrant, may modify the warrant. Um, if the warrant issues, uh, or issues as modified by the court, then uh, it is uh, executed by law enforcement authorities. Um, and you know later on, if the party whose information was um, seized as part of the warrant uh, has some objection based on probable cause or some other objection, then they might be able to uh, move to suppress the evidence later on at trial. So. In this section B, notice the requirements for venue, and this is very important. So now a warrant request is, um, in, in federal court, is ordinarily going to be before a magistrate judge. So recall that in the federal judicial system, 
there are district court judges who are Article III judges who are going to um, hear um, substantive motions, who are going to preside over trials, um, and then there are magistrate judges who are primarily tasked with, in civil cases, tasked with overseeing discovery, and in criminal cases, tasked with, um, in particular, things like issuing warrants, uh, and then other kinds of proceedings. Now, there are cases in which a magistrate judge might hear a trial or a substantive motion, but that um, usually depends on the party's consent. So here, um, it's a core responsibility of the magistrate judge. I if there's no magistrate judge reasonably available, it could be a judge in a state court. Um, so notice also that it's the magistrate judge within the district um, where the person or the property to be seized is located. And this is important because it's traditionally thought that a local magistrate is the more appropriate venue for a warrant because the local magistrate is going to presumably um, be more in touch with the local community, is going to have more of an ongoing relationship with, the, with local law enforcement and the local prosecutors, um, as well as with the local defense bar. Uh, and, you know, therefore is going to be uh, less likely to simply abuse the power of the warrant and more likely to, to um, use it responsibly. So, you know, notice that in, in most of these subsections of Part B here, we're, we're talking about a person or property uh, located within the district. We've got, um, you know, some possibility of issuing a warrant for a person or property outside of, of the district if the property is located within the dis district when issued but might, might have moved. Um, we have some other special proceedings for, uh, for terrorism cases. Notice that in subpart 4, there's, there's special authority for, for tracking devices, um, which may include movements both inside and um, outside the district. Notice in Section 5, there are some special provisions for magistrate judges in the District of Columbia um, for other kinds of uh, property or, or land relating to government property. But in particular, notice um, subsection 6. And um, this is a relatively new addition to the rules of criminal procedure within the past um, past few years. And it was it was sort of controversial when it was adopted. Um, the way these rules get um, changed or modified is um, by recommendation ultimately from uh, the Supreme Court. It still has to be approved by Congress, but it's a bit of an unusual uh, procedure in that it's not affirmative legislation that uh, sort of has to uh, be voted on, but it gets presented by the Supreme Court, and there's a, there's a process through which it can be uh, objected to if Congress has an objection to it. But uh, this um, sort of sailed through, and a number of civil liberties groups raised it at the time that it was proposed, but um, nevertheless it went through. So uh, this has to do with the possibility of a magistrate judge in a district where any activities, where activities related to a crime may have occurred to issue what's called a remote access warrant, um, or kind of in the lingo of law enforcement, a RAT, a remote access tool, and then also to use a NIT, or a network investigative technique. Um, and this would include electronic storage media and electronically stored information located either within or outside the district. And that is if the media or information has been concealed through technological means, um, or if the investigation relates to a uh, computer, a certain kind of computer crime. Um, now, you know, there's an, some examples I've seen of uh, federal law enforcement using these uh, rats and nits in, include, for example, in child pornography cases, and in one sort of very notable child pornography case over the past couple of years, um, where through other investigative techniques they were able to identify um, particular uh, internet service provider that they knew was being used to um, host and transfer child pornography files and they were able to upload a piece of malware onto that system 
um, which allowed them through that malware to uh, track users who were using that server and that system to trade child pornography files. Um, so, you know, a rat or a nit could be a what otherwise we might consider a piece of, of, of malware or some other way in which the government could remotely monitor. Now, this was controversial, obviously, against the backdrop again of the um, Edward Snowden revelations about the National Security Administration and the kind of warrantless wiretapping um, of internet and email systems. Um, and some civil liberty, liberties groups viewed this as kind of a backdoor way of the government being able to do uh, something very broadly similar to that NSA program. Now, of course, this is a warrant. It requires a showing of probable cause. It's a much higher standard um, than the Stored Communications Act or than the uh, FISA statute. Um, but nevertheless, it's pretty broad, and it's um, something that I wanted you to notice. Now, in Section C here, you can see the kinds of things that a warrant can issue for. So evidence of a crime, contraband. Contraband, by the way, would include um, child pornography files, which are unlawful to possess. Property for, uh, intended for use in committing a crime, a person to be arrested, or a person who's unlawfully restrained to, to retrieve them from those restraints. Section D tells us the procedure uh, for obtaining the warrant and gives us the um, kinds of information that have to be submitted to the court and the requirement of probable cause, which of course is um, a constitutional requirement. Section 2 says that the uh, court can require the person signing an affidavit to appear personally. Um, this isn't really the ordinary procedure. It's ordinarily on the, on the papers, but occasionally a court will want to hear um, testimony to flesh out parts of an affidavit. Section E gives us the uh, contents of what the warrant has to say. And, you know, the thing to notice here is simply um, that warrants um, have time constraints, time limitations, uh, and uh, if it's sort of an ongoing warrant that's going to have to take longer than the ordinary time limitations in the warrant, then the, then the um, government will have to go back to court and seek another warrant or, um, or ask for an ex extension. And this may be particularly important in the case of a uh, tracking device. So part F, executing the warrant. When the government executes the warrant, uh, it has to uh, take note of the time it was executed, take an inventory, uh, give a receipt, and so on. And there's uh, similar kinds of procedures for a tracking device. So this is a uh, basic, really quick overview about Federal Rule of Criminal Procedure 41. And the thing that I particularly want you to note is the uh, subsection 6 that we talked about concerning uh, rats and nits. And as we go on uh, in this class, you'll see some other statutes under which the government may gain access to electronic information short of a warrant.